All right, we're going to get started. We've got a really exciting agenda, but um, it's always quite busy, so I think I'm going to kick things off, and we're definitely going to have more people be, be joining online as well, too. So hello, everyone. Welcome to today's seminar. My name is Nancy Tout, and I'm the Chief Scientific Officer of the Global Institute for Food Security at the University of Saskatchewan. And before those of us gathered here in person today, we acknowledge that we are on Treaty 6 territory in the homeland of the Métis, we pay our respect to the First Nations and the Métis ancestors of this place and reaffirm our relationship with one another. And for the people that are joining us online today, and I know we have over 200 people registered, um, please feel free to type in the chat your land acknowledgement today. So I also wanted to take a moment to first of all to say thank you. And we've had really good reception. As I said, the registrations have just been really pouring in uh, to the seminar. And I know that we all keep very, very full schedules. So your time and energy you bring to this topic today is really greatly appreciated. We've received registrations from attendees in Canada and the US as well as overseas, representing organizations across industry, government, and academia. And I particularly wanted to say thank you to all of those gathered here in Saskatoon and Innovation Place today. I enjoy seeing so many of the familiar faces in our innovation ecosystem um, that are advancing innovation to enhance sustainable agriculture production and global food security. Due to the complexity of schedules, both speakers are going to be joining us online today, but there's nothing better to be facilitating this session with a live studio audience. So I do have to say thank you so much for participating and we're going to reward you with treats at the side of the room there and a great networking opportunity that can continue after our session this afternoon. So again, whether you're joining in person or online, we hope you find today's presentations informative and we look forward to great dialogue. For though, just a bit of housekeeping, for those joining online, we ask that you keep your microphones muted for the duration of the meeting. If you have any questions, please enter them into the chat and a moderator is going to follow up with you. And we do have two presentations today, after which we will have some time for questions. That's great. And we ask that everyone save any questions you have for that portion of the program. And at that time, we'll take questions from those in the room and from those online. And once again, if you are online, enter the question in the chat. And I do have some, some team members who are going to help me out. So I also want to say happy Halloween and happy Diwali as well. So there's lots going on today, a very special day. And I know when we were planning this event, I was like, how can we incorporate the Halloween theme into it? Um, so we decided that there's actually nothing spooky here, nothing scary. There are no tricks and there's only treats. And it is both a treat and an honor to have two very special guests with us today. Today is all about great science, leading edge technologies and world-class talent to deliver impact. All are foundational to our topic today accelerated breeding for livestock and crops, and the strategies and the technologies that drive it. This is the third for those that have joined us previously in a series of seminars we've hosted on this topic. And in previous seminars, we've examined both what accelerated breeding is and why it is needed to advance food security. In today's discussion, we want to explore impact and the kind of gains we can drive through innovative science and more important, through collaboration. An essential theme for today is, in fact, partnerships and how we can work differently together to leverage our strengths, solve problems, and realize our goals, both individually and collectively, maximizing the return for stakeholders and consumers. This kind of innovation and collaboration is foundational to the work that we do at the Global Institute for Food Security. And for anyone that doesn't know who GIFS is, we are truly a unique industry, government, and academia partnership with a bold vision of a world where everyone has access to safe and nutritious food. Our mission is to work with partners, and that's the most important part of that mission statement, to discover, develop, and deliver innovative solutions for the production of globally sustainable food. And we do this by reinvesting in relevant technology platforms that transform scientific capabilities, increase the capacity of our partners, and decrease the time between the discovery of that innovative science and its delivery to the marketplace. Across all of our activities, we are focused on solving big issue challenges facing agriculture and global agri-food by partnering with public, private, and academic innovators across the entire value chain. 
Which brings us to accelerated breeding. And as many of you know, GIFS has spent the last few years establishing and operationalizing an accelerated breeding program that leverages our technology platforms, including the Omics and Precision Analytics Lab, what we call OPAL, and our Data Management and Analytics Services, DMA. And they serve as foundational partnerships with plant and livestock breeders. And earlier this year, we were very excited to announce a $5 million investment from Farm Credit Canada into the FCC Accelerated Breeding Program at GIFS to help us bring this genomic selection, speed breeding, bioinformatics, and computational capacity to Canada's innovation ecosystem. We are so grateful for this investment, which supports the development of our talent and technology and enables partnerships individually with breeding consortiums, as well, individually with breeding organizations, and through consortium-based approach, which we're going to hear about today. The need for this kind of innovation and collaboration is paramount. We know that agricultural productivity is lagging globally, and Canada is no exception. A 2023 report by FCC identifies a $30 billion opportunity over the next 10 years to rekindle Canada's agriculture productivity growth. An accelerated breeding which combines a suite of technologies and solutions is one of these innovations to help us achieve these goals, driving productivity, competitiveness, and sustainability for farmers and agri-food stakeholders. These strategies have been verified by organizations over the last generation, starting in the dairy sector, and we've ex we're excited to dig into some of these case studies today that demonstrate the impact of these innovations and collaborations. So we are going to start in the, the Canadian dairy sector whose breeding industry has been revolutionized by genomic selections since it was adopted 15 years ago. And to tell us more, I'd like to welcome Dr. Christine Bays. Christine was born and raised on a dairy farm in southwestern Ontario and learned to appreciate agriculture at a very young age. After completing a bachelor's degree at Guelph, she traveled to Germany to complete both a master's and a PhD and in quantitative genetics, genetics. She currently holds a Canada Research Chair in Livestock Genomics and is the Chair of the Department of Animal Biosciences at the University of Guelph. Dr. Bayes has been involved in numerous large-scale breeding projects in various species, swine, horses, dairy, cattle, and goats in Europe and North America. She has extensive experience in quantitative genetics, statistical genomics, and bioinformatics related to genetic and genomic evaluation in livestock. In her spare time, and I put that in air quotes because I'm not sure there's much of that, um, she does run a small farm outside of Mary Hill, Ontario. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Christine Bays, addressing genomics for a sustainable future. There we go. So that's the first step is unmuting myself. <laughs> and the second step is to share the screen. Can you see that? Yes. Perfect. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Nancy. And what a pleasure it is for me to uh, be able to speak with you today about some of the things we're doing um, in livestock. And I realized initially I was planning on showing multiple projects in multiple species, but I got so excited about what we're doing in dairy that I took out all the poultry stuff. So bear with me, but I think it's a good story anyway. Um, yes, uh, so I think what, I understand that there's a lot of plant breeders here as well. And I think what we can share and what we do share uh, is this probably very simple equation uh, as geneticists, um, that the phenotype is equal to a genotype plus some kind of an environment. And in dairy cattle, uh, you could say that the phenotype, for example, milk production is equal to some kind of, or the pedigree had some kind of an influence on the amount of milk production. And of course, the environment that the animal is in. And here you see a cow being milked. I think this is a Dutch woman. The wooden shoes are a bit of a giveaway there, but we have this very simple equation and together the genotype and the environment will make up how much milk an animal gives. Now, in today's world, of course, we've we've got new technologies. So we're not just talking about milk production anymore. We're talking about all of the things that we can analyze within those milk samples. When we talk about genotypes, we're using DNA and, and really 
high quality and, and very advanced technology to be able to understand exactly what's in that genotype. And of course, the environment has changed as well. Uh, we've incorporated robotic milking systems, et cetera, in the case of cows, but this model is really, can be used across any species or in, in plants or animals. In, when we think about dairy cattle selection, uh, we've been doing this for a long time and the development of selection goals have changed quite a bit over the past hundred years. Here you can see an excerpt from a paper written by uh, a colleague of mine, Filippo Miglior et al. Uh, in 2017. And it shows um, on the x-axis, you can see years. And on the y-axis, you can see the percentage of breeding goal that was used. So we've in the, up until about the 1990s, we were looking for confirmation traits. So how our cows looked and also production traits. And that was about it. We didn't really care about anything else. We were just breeding for milk production and beautiful cows. Now, that kind of changed in the 90s where we added a whole bunch of other additional traits, things like longevity, calving ease, workability of these animals, health traits, and fertility. And today, uh, I'm, I realize you probably can't read this, but this is a graph showing the 102 different traits that are currently incorporated into the index which is used to select Canadian dairy cattle. And that breadth of trait just shows how complex uh, breeding has gotten, but also how important it is to take in other aspects of an animal or a plant uh, when you're considering which generation, which genes should be passed on to the next generation. The results of this uh, are pretty cool. <laughs> if you think about uh, what's happened in terms of productivity, this is a graph showing uh, the amount of milk production and the number of cows in Canada since 1960. On the x-axis, you can see 1960 to about 2024. Uh, the blue bars uh, show the total amount of milk being produced. And the blue line in dark blue shows the number of cows in Canada. As in many other countries uh, in the Western world, the number of cows has decreased significantly since uh, the 1960s. In fact, we now have 2 million less cows than we did then, but yet the amount of milk that these animals produce has been maintained or even has increased. Uh, this is pretty amazing, <laughs> I think. Uh, in this way, the graph kind of shows the resiliency of the dairy industry as a whole in the face of changing production systems. And yet, when you Google cows or dairy cows or milk production, you might come up with some pictures like this. Um, livestock products, including dairy, are responsible for greenhouse gas emissions, uh, in some cases more than other food systems, and in ruminants, that's just because the microbes in the cows decompose and ferment plant materials, like cellulose, fiber, starches, sugars, etc., that we can't digest. Uh, this is pretty cool <laughs> because we can't digest those things. But on the other hand, the enteric methane that's a byproduct of this digestive uh, process is really quite pot potent stuff. Uh, there's a spoiler alert here. Most of the methane that uh, cows produce comes out of the front end of the cow, not the back end. So don't worry about these pictures. They're, they're not quite accurate. <laughs> but at this stage, we do know that cows are important uh, and be letting them or helping them become more efficient uh, is going to be a really important part of, of food security moving, moving forward. So in the face of increasing societal scrutiny towards agriculture, uh, it's, pretty it's pretty important to do what we can to address this. Um, I think in the face of slim profit margins as well, um, the, ch the climate is changing. So resiliency and efficiency are, are really more important than they ever have been before. And we hear the term sustainability. So I think it's important to talk about what the definition of sustainability is. And this is, the definition really is the balance between the needs of the economy, the environment, and the society. And it's very interesting when you look back at how people thought about breeding. Uh, in, for example, the 1970s, Harris made this quote, efficiency is measured by a comparison of production with cost in energy, time, and money. In the year 2000, Olison et al. said animal breeding determined only by short-term market forces 
leads to unwanted side effects. And in 2015, Venture said one of the things that's been that's become quite clear as we've done genomes is that we're probably much more genetic animals than we want to confess we are. So society is also very important when we think about the philosophy of how we're changing um, these organisms. And I think that we have a huge potential to improve um, this type of, of approach. We have a big opportunity to improve a sustainable livestock and of course in, in other areas as well. So the question is, how can genetics and genomics improve livestock sustainability? Um, I'm gonna give you a very brief overview of what we've, how I see this. Um, and maybe this graphic will help show that it's been quite a long road already and there's quite a long way to go. What I'm going to talk about today uh, with regards to methane emission and feed efficiency started back in 2012 with the collection of milk spectral data. Uh, we'll get more into that later on, but a storage pipeline um, and the, the sort of bioinformatics developed to maintain and manage that, uh, that data storage pipeline has been around since 2012. Since 2018, 90% of cows, milk recorded cows in Canada, have this data stored in a centralized database. So keep that, keep that in mind. In 2014, uh, we were very, very fortunate to receive funding from Genome Canada, as well as a number of provincial genome centers uh, and a large number of industry um, groups to do the Efficient Dairy Genome Project. And that was a project that focused on feed efficiency and methane emission databases with a lot of data. In 2018, we put forward the Resilient Dairy Genome Project uh, it's just wrapping up now, but that's what I'll, I'll talk about. Really, the goal of that project was to increase the number of data points uh, collected and to use genomics to improve uh, resiliency in dairy cattle. That allowed us to start a whole slew of new regional initiatives. And then now in 2023, we are working on the Dairy Net Zero uh, Genome Project, which will um, really give us a roadmap for greenhouse gas emissions. And of course, since 2013, multiple projects to include genotype, genotypes of animals with medium to high density chips have been, um, yeah, have been conducted. So the Resilient Dairy Genome Project is a, a project that is very dear to my heart. Um, we are trying here to make animals uh, able to adapt rapidly to changing conditions without compromising productivity, health, or fertility, while becoming resource efficient and reducing their environmental burden. So in German, there's a fantastic saying, we're looking for an egg-laying wool milk sow, a creature that doesn't exist, but we can do our best to, uh, to work towards that. Of course, uh, the, Nancy had mentioned that the focus of today is also on uh, collaboration. So I wanted to show you the, the number of organizations and the type of organizations that we're working with here for the Resilient Dairy Genome Project. You can see um, a number of Canadian universities, but also a whole bunch of international partners, both in industry and in research, uh, have come together. In total, we have over 38 organizations here who are involved and who are collecting data, working towards a, a common goal. And that is so much fun. <laughs> we think of our project uh, kind of as an engine, uh, the fuel of which is represented by further developing phenotype collection in three key areas of dairy, uh, closer to biology fertility, enhanced disease resistance, and feed efficiency coupled with methane reduction. So these are activities within the project that are focused on collecting phenotypes for these different uh, types of, of um yeah, types of animals, I guess. The second important component of our proposal is the actual engine of it. And that's composed of understanding genomic and environmental relationships between both novel traits and existing traits, um, incorporating multi-generational analysis and epigenetic information. And of course, it's made possible through a, a data management system that is uh, clear for all of these incoming phenotypes. Now, for those of you who are familiar with the Genome Canada um, way of life, there is always a, a GELS component. GELS is an acronym standing for genomics. It's ethical, environmental, economic, legal, and societal 
aspects. And that is, I see the gels component of this project really as the oil because it makes everything work. Um, with these sort of powerful uh, and well-functioning parts of the engine, we can actually move towards our ultimate goal of translation and implementation, including genomic tools to select for resilient cows. So I'm gonna go through the individual activities of this project just because I think they're so cool. And for those of you who are interested in the, the scientific results, I'm gonna give you a little glimpse of it, but uh, we can talk more about that later. I know that time is tight, so I'll, I'll move through. Uh, the first activity is led by Dr. Ronaldo Seri of the University of British Columbia. He's looking at standardizing phenotypes uh, based on automatic sensors. So just as we have Fitbits, cows might have uh, pedometers or uh, rumination collars, and we're looking at trying to measure and see how physiological factors affecting estrus expression and embryo survival affect actual fertility of these animals. Um, we're looking for genomic markers to, to see if there's an association between uh, expression estrus express, expression and fertility. And then there's other new fertility phenotypes. Uh, Ronaldo and his team have done a lot of research over the years. And what they've seen is really that there is a connection between pregnancy losses and the uh, amount of activity during estrus. Uh, he's shown that reduced estrus expression results in more failed ovulations. And our team here in Guelph has done some work on uh, transmission ratio distortion, showing that some eggs are more willing to expand accept sperm from some um, gametes or some gametes are more viable than others just uh, from a statistical standpoint. So it's really quite interesting once we get into the, um, there's a mix here between biology, uh, statistics and genetics that's really fascinating. And ultimately what we're trying to do is increase the amount of, uh, or the general level of fertility of our animals. Uh, the second activity is focused on enhanced disease risk resistance. Here too, um, we've been able to incorporate fertility disorders into routine genomic analysis. Um, and we are developing methods for genomic evaluation of additional traits that haven't been looked at before. Things like calf respiratory disease and diarrhea or leukosis um, or the neurogenitor, the, the neural um, degenerative problem of, of crampy in cows. It's just a it's not a very nice problem that cows have, but uh, we, there is a genetic component to that as well. Some of the work that we've done has shown that there is heritability, uh, meaning that we can actually address some of these problems using genomic selection and genetic selection. Um, for example, we've already been through the fact that we can find uh, candidate genes affecting leukosis um, in cattle from our data sets, and uh, the same is true for uh, for crampy animals as well. So there are, although these, these diseases are low heritability, there are ways that we can incorporate them into selection programs. The third activity is focused on feed efficiency and methane emissions. Um, really the goal here was to enlarge the reference population for feed efficiency phenotypes and methane emission phenotypes. Uh, this does mean that we're actually measuring individual animals. So we have to measure how much a cow eats every day and how much they uh, erupt as well, individually. And uh, that's a lot of work. That's why this hasn't been uh, an easy process, but we've been quite successful so far. Currently, we have uh, 15,000 animals, over 15,000 animals measured for feed efficiency, and over 4,000 animals measured for, for methane emissions. Um, this data will go into or does flow into uh, the further activities such as activity four, which is led by Dr. Flavio Schenkel to predict breeding values for resilience traits using multi-trait GWAS and meta-analysis to identify really the genomic regions that, are, um, that have pleiotropic effects on these different novel resilience traits. And also to look at different variants that are causing um, or that are associated with these phenotypes, things like copy number variants uh, and other types of genetic variants can be responsible for some of the variation that we see. Uh, adaptation traits are really important here as well. So we're looking as well at the effects of heat stress on these important traits. Uh, here are just some, some graphs from some of the publications that we've, that we've looked at. Uh, this is showing the relationship between copy number variants uh, and re reproduction and disease uh, phenotypes. Here we've got heritability estimates for uh, temperature humidity index by random regression models. And here we're looking at um, 
we're looking at correcting for known sources of environmental variation. So we're seeing which animals uh, produce the most milk in the different types of, um, of environments across Canada. The fifth activity is being led by Dr. Marc-André Serrard from the Université Laval. He's doing the super cool stuff, um, multi-generational effects in epigenetics, trying to quantify the effect of early environment on the resilience of daughters. Um, his survey has been looking for epigenetic signatures on really precisely phenotyped animals, and he has indeed shown some preliminary results um, from whole genome bisulfite sequencing, uh, and you, we can actually see the differences here in um, in methylation of those different uh, of those different genotypes. So super cool results. Dr. Paul Stothard leads activity six, uh, which is the data management portion of this project. Uh, he's looking as well at whole genome sequence data for variants, um, genotypes, functional annotations, all that cool stuff. And he's him and his team have created this fantastic um, structural variant database, which is showing, really visualizing all of the things that we're finding from the phenotypic activities in a, a one-stop shop, really, for, for showing those associations and being able to, uh, to further analyze them. Super cool. So another main point here is that they've made a pipeline for methylation uh, sequencing. And super cool is that we can genotype millions of SNPs per sample from whole genome bisulfide sequencing and use those SNPs for, uh, for quantitative genetic analysis. Maybe not the cheapest way to do things, but uh, also good because we get both, both the benefits from that. Activity seven uh, is led by the dynamic duo of uh, Professor Ellen Goddard and Professor Gaitu Hailu. Ellen is at the University of Alberta and Gaitu is here in Guelph. Uh, this has always been kind of an interesting part of these Genome Canada projects because the social scientists just think differently <laughs> than, than the, the natural scientists. But what I've learned from this is that they can really give fantastic insight into how people think um, and how decisions are made. And almost most importantly is the public acceptance of what we're doing with all of our fantastic science. So I'm just gonna give a little, one little snippet of what they've learned. They asked the question if selective breeding could be used to solve the environmental impacts of the dairy industry in Canada, do you think that you would be happy? And I wonder what you would be if you would be happy, but the results showed that while most people said yes, um, there were some uh, survey recipients who, who were not sure or who, who said no, and I'm not sure. I, I like to be a happy person. I think maybe we have to think more about um, how to make people happy, maybe, <laughs> but also understanding that there is a general, um, there's a general agreement to this, but what does that mean for developing breeding programs and bringing the public and the consumer along uh, with us is, is really important. And we need to work together with social scientists and people with other skill sets to, um, to be able to transfer that knowledge and, and get that communication open. Finally, the eighth uh, activity is focused on translation and implementation. Uh, it was led by Dr. Garrett Kistemacher, who unfortunately passed away last year. Uh, Dr. Filippo Miglior of Lactonet was able to, to pick up in his place and lead us forward with this. Um, this project is, is really an example of some pretty successful uh, things in that we have been able to implement from the research all the way through to actual Canadian genetic evaluations that are publicized um, in a number of different areas. So fertility disorders were published in 2020, feed efficiency was published in 2021, body maintenance requirements and methane efficiency was published in 2023. And we have to say that Canada was the first country in the world to develop genomic evaluations for methane efficiency in dairy cattle. And I think that's, that's a pretty fantastic result. Uh, the, the original goal of this project was to develop uh, a, a standalone resiliency index, but that changed into integrating modernized um, lifetime performance index and pro dollars. Uh, here you can see the traits listed uh, and the stage of implementation right now. We're hoping that by next year, some of these uh, implemented, um, or sorry, some of these under development and under review are actually implemented as well. 
But what we've seen is that the modernized lifetime performance index of Lactonet, which is the organization responsible for national genetic evaluations in Canada for dairy cattle, has indeed um, docked with, with our project. And we've been able to transfer the results from these different activities into this actually used performance index, which I think is, is really phenomenal. And it doesn't often happen this way in research. It's, it's not like we just write our publications and then we're done. Um, this is actually being implemented. And through this team effort, we've had really a lot of success. Um, the results of this project uh, have allowed us to be, uh, a, we've received a number of awards like the International Dairy Federation. Um, they have an award for innovation in climate action. Uh, that was awarded to the team. Uh, the University of Guelph's Innovation of the Year Award was awarded in 2023. And there is a, a big long list that has to happen here when you're moving research through industry all the way through to application. Uh, you have to get all the team members on board and you have to kind of pull the same string in the same direction in order to get where you, where you need to go. Very briefly, I wanna talk about some future directions as well, because it's pretty exciting too. Uh, we are leveraging genomics to achieve dairy net zero. Um, this is a project, this is a new uh, interdisciplinary challenge team project that is funded mainly through Genome Canada, through its provincial organizations as well. Um, again, we have a, a fully, a new fully integrated partnership here with organizations both in and outside of Canada, um, academic organizations, but also uh, a number of industry partners and the goal here is to further expand uh, our database um, to uh, have 16,000 dairy cows, 13,000 beef and beef, uh, beef dairy crossbred animals. This is, this is fantastic. <laughs> I think it's fantastic because finally we can sort of try to move some knowledge from one industry into, into another. Um, this interdisciplinary challenge team uh, is part of a portfolio. So there are six main activities. Uh, again, you'll see the gels component right in the middle of that. Um, but here we're trying to develop ultimately activity six, which is the, the, a roadmap for greenhouse gas management. Now, because of the portfolio aspects of this ICT competition, we do have a series of docking stations woven into the fabric of this project. And these docking stations will allow us to interface with the Gen Genome Canada Data Hub and knowledge mobilization teams to facilitate interactions with other projects that have been funded both within and outside of this Genome Canada competition. So it's pretty cool, I think. Um, I'm not sure how this is actually going to work, but if we build it into our, our framework, uh, the ability to collaborate and to take in information from other projects as well as to feed our information into other projects, I think we're gonna maybe be able to really leverage uh, the amount of research dollars that are being spent um, here towards, uh, towards climate change and towards our adaptation and mitigation of, of climate change. So a lot of people don't know what we mean when we talk about uh, a roadmap for greenhouse gas reduction. Uh, here, we're trying to consolidate methane emission data at the animal and herd levels. Uh, we're trying to quantify potential greenhouse gas reductions through both genetic and nutritional aspects. Um, we're going to, of course, keep working on our methane genomic evaluations uh, while understanding public attitudes, behaviors um, to emissions reductions and developing and implementing methane herd book monitoring and benchmarking tools. And that's kind of the roadmap and what that looks like we love making graphics I'm a pretty visual my students are really visual but I I like to see pictures too so we've got all of these different genetic factors uh, and nutritional factors that will work together uh, that will combine to really start to uh, address the the amount of emissions per cow and you can see that there's probably a variation between the num between the different farms that we're looking at but with a, a clear roadmap and different tools, for, from a nutritional standpoint and from a genetic standpoint, we should be able to reduce the amount of methane produced on those cows. So the, the deliverables of this project, the, we've got a big goal, that's to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions by 55% within 
without impacting uh, production. And of course, that has a that has a price tag with it. Um, not really a price tag, but that has a, a, a financial benefit, I guess, uh, including a $102 million per year benefit due to improved production efficiency and animal welfare. So we're hoping here for positive impacts on consumers, rural communities, and the environment, as well as public and wider, um, wider stakeholders. We need producer engagement, which has been fantastic so far. And ultimately, we would like to have accurate and robust methods for estimating individual animal and herd level greenhouse gas emissions for use in national policy and in greenhouse gas inventories. Because right now, um, it's not really it's not really focused on individual animals, but I think we can we can estimate the amount of greenhouse gases being produced by our Canadian dairy cows with quite high accuracy today already. We just have to get that into into policy. So in summary, um, we can use uh, genetic and genomic methods to increase the efficiency of the dairy industry and other industries as well. Dairy is just an example. We've done similar things in poultry and in other livestock species. Um, it's important to remember that sustainability has a number of different uh, legs that it stands on, including economy, environment, and society. And teamwork really does make the dream work. And with that, I would like to thank all of the um, all of my students, uh, postdocs and master students and uh, PhD students, as well as our uh, technicians and our project management team. If there are students in your room, Nancy, remind them that we're we're recruiting. So if anyone is interested in coming and working with our team, we would be more than happy to speak with them. And I would like to thank really from the bottom of my heart, all of the funders and the collaborators that have been involved in this and all of you for your attention and Nancy for the fantastic invitation. Thank you so much. Amazing. I love that last team slide. And we say, instead of the dream work, we say innovation is a team sport. That's what we like to say at GIFTS too. And when we have recruited our quantitative genetics from Christine's program. So I know we, you know, we think about how we exchange talent and make sure that, um, you know, we're, 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 we're looking for the best talent to be able to provide these kinds of programming. So we're, as a reminder, we're going to save questions for Christine. We're going to switch gears right now, but thank you so much, Christine. I was amazed when you talked about, I think I caught this number right, 102 different traits um, along your genomic selection index. And that's just a big wow for me. And so I, I, I'm very excited about our, our discussion. So we're gonna now turn our attention to the crop sector where new breeding technologies, notably, let me get to the right slide here. Are you clicking? You can bump it back. There we go, okay. Um, where new breeding technologies, notably genomic prediction, are being used by many private as well as some public breeding programs to accelerate the breeding cycle and increase the rate of genetic gain for yield and other quantitative traits. The sustainability of Canada's breeding and variety development programs are largely funded through federal and provincial governments and commodity groups, and that has been a topic of discussion for many years, and it seems to have reared its scary head, and that's from bringing in the the, uh, the Halloween theme today. And this discussion focuses on the reality of Canada's shrinking R&D budgets, the need to have all hands on deck, including both public and private breeding organizations, both large and small, and access to every tool in the toolbox, included, including rapid cycling genomic selection. What is clear is that if we want accelerated breeding more broadly and genomic selection specifically to reach its full potential, to deliver higher rates of genetic gain to growers, we need to reduce barriers and create the right environment for it to happen. And at this time, it's my honor to introduce Dr. Clay Sneller, who calls himself the chief instigator of one such environment uh, that has emerged in the US, who will discuss the impact of a breeding consortium, how a program can be both small and big at the same time. And given the challenges ahead in Canada's productivity gap, this is no time to be thinking small. Dr. Sneller has been involved in plant breeding for 40 years and agriculture for 45 years, having obtained his MSc and PhD at Michigan State University, then becoming the soybean breeder at the University of Arkansas for 10 years. He transitioned at the, as the wheat breeder at the Ohio State University since 2001, 
where he also teaches quantitative genetics and advanced plant breeding. And 2000, since 2008, he has conducted research on ways to use genomic selection. He's been very active in research and education efforts in, in Africa. In fact, he's just returned from there. I'm not even sure he's had time to hit the pillow yet. He was lead scientist at the Integrated Genotyping Service and Support Platform in Nairobi for three years. And since 2019, he has been a consultant with the Excellence in Breeding Platform, working to optimize breeding schemes for multiple crops across multiple countries. Dr. Sneller has also recently formed a genomic selection-based breeding consortium involving soft winter wheat breeding programs at Ohio State, Purdue, University of Kentucky, University of Illinois, and Illinois Champaign, and that's what he's going to talk about today. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Clay Sneller, and hopefully we can get him online here. I'm, okay, I assume you can all hear me now. Well, first of all, thank you for uh, inviting me to give this presentation. It's going to be a very exciting thing to do, and I, I have been home now for a couple of days, so I have hit the pillow after uh, three and a half weeks in Africa, three countries, and 12 different flights, but I'm, I'm pretty fully recovered. So let me uh, share my screen, and we'll get started. Get rid of a few things here. And I'm assuming everyone can see my slides now. Not hearing otherwise, I'm going to go ahead and get started. So, yeah, I'm going to talk about a breeding consortium that we have been uh, have, uh, formed a couple years ago. And uh, it's a way to try to leverage all of our resources from our small individual programs into being much uh, to, into a much bigger program. And this is something that's been evolving. And I like this quote here, you know, we go down a lot of wrong roads to find the right one. We think we're getting closer to being on the right one, but of course directions always change and we're always uh, trying new things. So here's our consortium. As uh, Nancy said, there are six different states in here and I am the chief instigator uh, this is a very informal group. We actually do not have any sort of charter or formal documentation. We don't have a designated uh, principal investigator. So, but we do need someone to kind of push everything along, and that's my role. Uh, we call our consortium Norgrains, and as it is quite informal. In fact, I would venture that most of administrators in our universities probably do not know we exist, but we do exist, and we're trying to function as well as we can. So. Our goals are quite simple. We really want to get faster release of more cultivars, get the seed to growers faster. We like to access more germplasm. We like to learn and get better, and we like to leverage all of our resources. So what we've been trying to do is get more lines into a regional trial. We get more from that. We can get more data sooner. We can make earlier decisions, earlier increases of seeds, and therefore get seed to growers sooner. And also, as we go through this, we think we can just be more efficient at all of our breeding, increase our selection intensity, and uh, just you know, do a better job of everything that we try to do. So now this consortium is the result of a pretty, a long, pretty much a long scale evolution. Uh, back in 1996, the U.S. Wheat Barley Scab Initiative was started, and this kind of gave money to a lot of the breeding programs that are part of this consortium, the six programs. And for a long time, even before 1996, these programs have been sharing some germplasm and doing some cooperative phenotyping, but really just focusing on the very most elite germplasm from each of the six programs, tested uh, moderately uh, thoroughly th across uh, all of our environments of these six states. As time go went along, the U.S. Wheat Barley Scab Initiative wanted more coordination amongst the projects. So the six programs became part together, uh, got lumped together in what was called a coordinated project. And now we're all, each one much more informed about what each other was doing. And we also had some common funding. Uh, and nothing forms a consortium and forms a team better than common funding. So we started getting some common funding across all six programs. And that led us to be, again, more of a consortium. And as things gone along, 
funding has gone up. And in 2019, we started actually getting money from the SCAB initiative to do joint genotyping together so that all, all lines from all programs were genotyped the same. And therefore, we could also now start to use genomic selections to start to leverage our resources amongst these programs. In 2020, we also now got a grant from the NEFA to start to do some common phenotyping and genotyping across all the programs and start to try to implement more of a, an extensive germplasm sharing and testing program. And in 2023, we got another NEFA grant, another federal grant to uh, initiate what we call the Big Six trial. And the Big Six trial was originated to try to rectify some of the issues we were having with the previous NIFA grant, and also, of course, to further our use of genomic selection. And so I'll be focusing a lot on this Big Six trial and what it does for us. And again, our whole goal here, sharing our germplasm, sharing data, sharing genotypic information and cost, using our genomic selection predictions, both within and between the different programs, expand the size of our early stage populations, and of course, exchange ideas. So here's our realities for these six programs. We're in a very competitive environment. We do have commercial companies also breeding for our, our region. A uh, typical variety lasts in Ohio about two and a half years before it's replaced with something new. And each of our programs are fairly small and modest, modest in size. So over here, you can see the uh, six programs, the uh, number of crosses we make per year, number of lines genotype, number of lines of stage one testing, et cetera. And each one of the programs by itself is actually fairly small compared to what some large commercial efforts might be, particularly in corn and soybeans and some of the major crops. But together, we are really one very large program. Together in one year, we genotype almost 8,000 new lines. And we phenotype almost 4,000 new lines a year in our stage one trials. Collectively, we're phenotyping close to 6,000 lines per year across these six programs. So if we can leverage our resources, we actually can start to function as more of one large program. And each of these programs do release a cultivars, public cultivars. Sometimes we license them to private companies. Each one has a unique breeding scheme, a, a unique way of using genomic selection. We each have our own limitations of resources. And we're not trying to make everyone breed everything the same way. We're just trying to get where we have common ground to leverage our resources into those common grounds. So to get a consortium to work, there are some things you have to have. So we have to have willing members who will see the benefits. You have to have a coordinator, an instigator. Uh, you might call it a director, a, pri uh, a primary inf uh, a principal investigator, but someone who really believes in it and pushes it along and, you know, tries to make, get, get everyone together, get everyone on the same page, and everyone uh, being happy uh, members of the consortium. We have to have effective in the communications and responsiveness, adherence to our timelines. We also we have to have pretty much common goals. We have to have common pro product profiles, common focus. These six programs all focus on yield, we all focus on resistance. You use head blight, our primary disease in our region. We focus on test weight, quality, same type of quality. So there's a lot of common things between our programs. Um, the germplasm from each program has to have value to all the others as well. For example, I, I'm here in Ohio. If the, the other six programs, other five programs, if their germplasm did not yield well in Ohio, then I really wouldn't be interested in testing their program, accessing their, their germplasm or anything else. So fortunately, these uh, six programs all have germplasm that has particular value to each other. And uh, as relates to genomic selection, most of our germplasm from these six different programs are quite related to one another. Basically, we've been intercrossing with each other material for decades and decades. So there's not a lot of population structure in our uh, set of lines across the six programs. Uh, the other thing, uh, to get the consortium to work, we have to have common genotyping platforms and markers that we can use in genomic selection. We have to uh, relevant test environments. Again, if one state has environments have no relevance to my environments in Ohio, then I would not be very interested in uh, test results from their environments. Luckily, all of us have environments that are relative to one another. Uh, all your partners have to have the ability to phenotype well, and we have to have an efficient way to share data. 
So with all these criteria, all six of us seem to fit in there. We all seem to be quite happy with uh, meeting all these criteria. So we're working together. And there are certain benefits to this consortium. And I'm gonna focus on some of these as shown in red, but we have reduced our genotype typing costs quite a bit because we send all our samples in together all at the same time. And we're getting GBS for as low as $7 a sample. So that's uh, quite a cost savings compared to what we were doing when everyone did in things individually. We do have a common database and access to data. So all six programs can get the data from everybody else. But the things I wanna talk about today is uh, our way of looking at testing, extensive testing of a large set of germplasm, analysis across environments and programs that are enabled by having all this data and all in the shared platform. Uh, we're looking at getting a shorter commercialization phase so we can get varieties out to farmers quicker and access to substantial quantities of elite germplasm because of the fact that together we are a large program. Uh, we want to look at efficient testing across multiple environments and, of course, sharing our knowledge and our training opportunities for our grad students. So germplasm exchange, before we had a consortium, we had cooperative tests, but each program put about eight lines in the regional trial. And when it really came down to it, uh, the programs had about 6,000 lines per year being phenotyped, but only about 40 of them were actually tested regionally. That's less than 1%. So more regional testing of more germplasm would be beneficial. So we had our first uh, consortium approach, and that seemed to help a little bit. Now, from the lines from every program, there was about 5,000 being tested, but the total of percentage across all two, more than two states was only about 3.7%. So this kind of ad hoc exchange of germplasm really wasn't helping us get to our goal, so of getting more lines tested regionally. So well, this is where we came up with the idea of the big six test. Big six, because there's six uh, states. Uh, you do see a couple of dots floating up here in Ontario. We do have some cooperative tests going on with the University of Guelph, with Helen Booker there. But the idea here is we have uh, each program, each of the six programs put 20 advanced lines into this big six trials. Six programs, that's 120 lines. We also have 50 preliminary lines from each of five programs, that's about 250. So each year we have about 390 lines being attested across some, if not most, of, if not all of these different sites. So that's 390 lines in the cooperative trial. 64% of these are what I would call early stage lines. These are not our most advanced, our elite germplasm now. These are lots of things that are earlier in the pipeline. This whole idea here is we are increasing the connectivity of, between our testing sites uh, with many lines over the entire region. This helps our GS accuracy. Uh, we place a lot of these early stage lines in this regional testing versus just a few very elite lines like we used to do. We get more regional data on more lines faster, which leads to more commercial, a faster commercial release and faster process of getting genetics into the farmer fields. And of course, everything is genotyped and we can use our data, our genomic predictions. One thing about the big six test was compared to our old ad hoc method of sharing germplasm is easy logistics. And this became painfully apparent as we tried a, an ad hoc way that everyone was just extremely frustrated with the amount of emails and back and forth and the fact that nothing was uniform and it made things very frustrating. But now we have one entry list, common names, common syntax, all lines are distributed to all cooperators and everyone gets the same amount of seed. Doesn't matter how much they need, they all get the same amount of seed and each cooperator sends their seed to everybody else. So that makes it very easy. We have a lot of common things in, in, uh, that are going on. Uh, one program, the University of Illinois, actually designs all of our experiments for, for this big six test and sends out the designs to the other five states. We also have some uh, analyses that are being done by, again, the University of Illinois over all the locations. So we have some things that are now being centralized and that seems to be um, helping a lot of people. So here's how we do things. All of our lines are in the big six trial and basically all of the lines in all the, all the trials and all the programs and all their locations. All lines are genotyped, uh, cast assays for some key markers for marker-assisted selection, uh, GBS, 
We're also developing a mid-density platform. All the phenotypic data is in the T3 database, uh, which is so easy access for everybody. Now everyone can get together and do the analyses, uh, diversity, structure of our populations. We're using factor analytics to uh, assess the genomic value of individuals across all these trials. We're doing spatial analysis within each location. Of course, looking at heritability, analyses of G by E, because all the data is available now, genomic selection, marker-assisted selection. And because of all these analyses are now being done across the entire region versus within individual programs, we think we're going to be able to make better decisions, better decisions on advancing lines from one stage to another, better release decisions, and uh, better decisions regarding crossing parents. So lots of benefits we think we have here. So here's just the impact as I see it on my own program in Ohio. So in Ohio, I have 20 lines in my most advanced trial, okay? And I also have 50 lines in what I call my stage three trials. Now, before, uh, before we got a consortium going, my stage one trial was only done at one location. My stage two trial was done at two locations, stage three at three locations, stage four at five locations. We got a little more efficient this time went along, but now here we are in the big six trial. My stage one, everything's genotyped. We do sparse testing. Everything is tested, every line is tested in at least two environments and we impute its value using genomic selection in two other additional environments. Same thing happens in stage two. But here is the big thing. Old days, stage three was three environments. Now my stage three lines are at nine environments, and that's shown by all these black dots. My stage four trials used to be five environments. Now they're at 16 environments. Okay, that's shown by all the white dots and the black dots. I'm getting so much more information on my lines much sooner than I ever did before. And this is a tremendous benefit to my program, and I assume also to all my colleagues, because they're seeing the same benefits in their programs. So, and you just think about this in terms of our whole breeding cycle. You know, we develop germplasm, we evaluate and select parents, take the best parents, cross them, start a new cycle. But we also have our product development phase, our more, more advanced stages of breeding. And we also have the commercialization phase. And of course, what the growers want are new lines coming out of the commercialization phase as quickly as possible. And this has really been a bit of a burden for us in our public breeding programs, because we don't get a lot of data that quickly. And also just the whole commercialization is a lot of extra work for us, which oftentimes is not really very well funded. So if we can try to step this up and be more efficient, that would be a nice thing for us. So here's what, again, looking at Ohio State, here's how we used to do things. Of course, the line development stage one, we had one location. So I had one location to make my decisions and advancing to stage two. After stage two, I have some more locations. Now I got three total locations, some from here, some from here. I've got three locations in which to make my decisions to put things into stage three. Another six lo more locations. Now I'm up to six locations to make my decisions to put things here. But you can see it takes a while for me to get a lot of locations, a lot of information to make good decisions. And because of that, I take some things, I start them into my commercialization phase shown over here. But I'm not really committed to them yet. I don't really know how good they are because I don't have much information. But yet I have to start commercialization anyways. So we start with some small purifications, some small increases, then the medium increase. By this time, I have enough data now to think, yeah, this just warrants a large increase. Let's do that. Let's get it out to the seed dealers. Let's get it out to the growers. But you can see it takes quite a while for this commercialization because I don't have much information to get started on. So now let's look at what's happening now that we have the big six. Now, stage one, sparse testing, I actually have four environments of information to start my decisions to put things into stage two. Eight locations here because of sparse testing, again, facilitated by, by the uh, genomic selection. And here's where things really take a big change. Stage three, all my stage three lines are in the big six. I have lots of information on how well these do again across a broader range of environments. I have 17 total environments now to make decisions, 
to put things into stage four. But more importantly, I have lots of information that helps me put things into purific larger purifications and larger seed increases earlier than before. Now I can get my information and my seed out to seed dealers. They can start to increase the seed and get it out to growers faster than they could before, almost two years faster. Since uh, 2021, we've had nine releases of new varieties, getting commercial seed out to growers faster. And this was always something that was quite a challenge to us. I tell a seed dealer or a seed in increaser, I have a new variety. I really want to release it. And the first thing they'd ask is, how much seed do I have? And I tell them, oh, I got 10 pounds. And they would just, their, their whole face would just fall down, you know. They were so disappointed. 10 pounds, that's all you got? Well, now when I have a new release, I can tell them I have 300 pounds because I've started up with larger seed increases and can get this seed to them faster, blow it up faster, get it to the growers faster. My uh, seed partners are much more uh, involved now. They're much, they're much happier because I have more seed earlier to get to them. And the other thing on this is also shorter breeding cycles. I, I'm still kind of old school. I like to see some phenotypic data. Yeah, we do genomic selection, but I still like to see some phenotypic data before I choose lines and go to the next stage. So here, six environments, finally, I really feel good about chick, taking parents from here and cycling them back up to here. But now, after stage two, I have eight environments. Uh, we're just going ahead and taking parents out of stage two and putting them up here. And we're even taking the lions out of first stage of testing with all of our new uh, sparse testing and more information on them and more genomic selection information. We're taking parents at the earlier stage and putting them up here. So we're getting shorter breeding cycles. Okay, so um, shorter commercialization cycles, shorter breeding cycles. Again, better information going out. Uh, more, more information sooner, better decisions quicker, better releases, better choice of parents, better everything. So the other thing I want to talk though about is uh, access to more germplasm because we have this consortium. Okay, the numbers in each of those states represents how many lines each state is, germ is uh, genotyping each year. So uh, I used to gen I still genotype about 800 new lines every year, but you can see how many lines some of my colleagues look at. Collectively, we're genotyping close to 8,000 new lines per year out of this consortium. Now, these are, you know, lines going into stage one testing. We don't have much phenotypic data on them, but we have so much phenotypic data from all of our past year's trials, including the big six, that we can use all that genotypic data, phenotypic data now in the GS model, and I can predict how well all 7,800 lines will do in Ohio. So we use this genomic selection to predict the value of all these lines, which of course many of them I've never seen in Ohio, but I can still predict how well they might do. And so we do that. We look at the predicted value of all 7,800 lines. And if uh, some lines look really good out of Illinois or Purdue or Kentucky, anywhere else, I then call up my cooperators and ask for access for them. Can I get seed of that? Because I want to put it in some trials in Ohio because it looks like it might be a winner for us. So I can now access so much more germplasm. And this just shows an example of this. Here's uh, looking at uh, lines from Ohio State. We predict their yield using data from 2021 Ohio. And same thing now, 2022 lines, we had 597. Um, we use some prediction based on 2022 phenotypes. And when I just had Ohio, I'd have could only pick from lines here in the Ohio set of bars. And of course, I picked the ones at the top. But that was 1,254 lines. But now I can actually predict value from all the lines, not only Ohio, but also from all my cooperators. In fact, in these two years, I have access to 8,265 lines. And I can pick the very top from each one. And you can see germplasm from all the other universities, they look like they have good value, predicted value in Ohio. Same thing over here. So I have was a relatively small program. Now I'm a big program, though I'm still just running about the same number of plots that I used to. I just have so much more access to more information. So in fact, in this past year, uh, 2024, 
25% of the lions in my stage three and four trials actually came from the other states because they looked like they did well. We phenotyped them. They are doing well in Ohio and they might be winners for us. So let's see. The other thing I want to talk about, I still have a few little bit of time, is sparse testing. We are looking at doing a lot of sparse testing. Right now, that big six trial, 330, 390 entries, it's grown across all those locations. Man, that's a lot of plots, right? You're thinking, do we really need to test all lines in all places? Well, that's what we want to look at. Can we do sparse testing and get similar results? So our goal here is we want to predict grain yield over all environments and do it as accurately as possible with a, you know, give, with a given number of plots. For example, we have example I'm going to use, we have 329 lines. Of course, they're all genotyped. And in this case, they're all phenotyped in seven different environments. Well, what we went through was a series of, uh, um, of simulations, masking a certain number of lines, and we wanted to vary the percentage of lines that were tested in more than one environment. We also wanted to vary if lines testing both environments, were they tested in one or in all seven environments. So what we're looking at is the degree of sparsity in these trials. For example, we can grow each line in just one environment. That would be 47 plots per environment, Every line is grown in just one environment. That's 329 plots. That's what we call 100% sparse. Every line is grown in just one out of seven environments. Here's where we are now, though. We have each line is grown in all environments, 329 plots per environment. That's 2,303 plots total. That's zero sparsity, okay? Every line is grown in every location. So, we started varying these things to see how they might impact our genomic selection accuracy and our ability to predict the grain yield over all environments. So here are some of our results for that. Here we used uh, data from 2023 as phenotypes to predict how well, uh, to predict the overall yield in 2023. And what we're looking at is what percentage of lines were grown in more than one environment. So down here would be 100% sparse Every line is grown in just one environment. Here is our other extreme. All lines are grown in all environments. So the first thing you see, uh, the less sparse the testing is, the better the GS accuracy is. 2024, they predict 2024. 2023, they predict 2023. But notice down here when we're 100% sparse, okay, the prediction actually is still pretty good. Each line is grown in just one environment. We're still able to predict the overall mean of all lines over all seven environments fairly accurately. You do notice here, though, using data from 2024 to predict 2023, not so good. 2023 to predict 2024, accuracy is not so good. But again, the less sparse you are, the further to the right you are, the better the accuracy is. And we look the same thing if lines were grown in just one environment, four environments, or seven environments. And again, the less sparse you were, the further to the right you go in this graph, the better the accuracy is. And again, trying to predict from one year to another was a, quite a challenge for us. So just to look at it a little bit differently, let's look at it in terms of number of plots, okay? So here we are, completely sparse, each line growing just one environment, 329 uh, plots total. Here is our accuracy. Each line is grown only in one environment. Okay, and here's the other extreme, 0% sparsity. All lines are grown in all environments. That's what the seven is. All lines grown in all seven environments. The black bar means 100% of the lines are grown in all these environments. And you can see, you know, again, our accuracy down here is 0.54. Now, using all of our resources, 2,303 2, plots, accuracy is 0.87. But let's say we want to know what would happen if we only wanted to grow somewhere between 1,000 to 1,050 plots. Well, here we can get an accuracy of about 0.71. 71% of our lines, 71% of all those lines are grown in, in four environments each. The remaining lines, the other 29%, are only grown in one environment. And we actually get pretty good accuracy with only 1,000, well, how many plots? Um, well, anyways, uh, I think there's 1,022 plots here. That's 44% of the plots that we had over here. 
So using 44% fewer plots, we're getting an accuracy of 0 0.71 point versus 0 0.87. So a drop in GS accuracy, but a lot more efficiency. We're saving a lot of money. The other thing we could do is say, well, okay, we don't need to save the money. Let's just grow more lines. So if we look at this type of scenario here, we can actually grow 183 more lines than we do now, one environment each. And we could do it for the same money as we do out here. So we could have either save money by growing fewer plots and getting very similar accuracy to using you know, 44% more plots, or we can just use the same amount of money and test 183 more lines. Uh, I am a believer that breeding is a numbers game and I like growing more lines. So, so let me see, with that, I know I'm just about out of time. So I'll just conclude very quickly. There are some real values, I think, to a breeding consortium. We are lowering our genotyping costs. We get more lines and multiple environment trials and at earlier stages. This makes more data sooner available, quicker decisions for, for crossing parents, advancing lines, and faster commercializations if possible. We also think we're gonna get a lot more efficient testing. We're gonna get more access to more germplasm across this, lore, this large group of breeders. So basically our small programs can now act like big programs. We can increase our selection intensity, shorter breeding cycles. And I, I don't wanna downplay this point, I haven't mentioned it much, but we're learning a lot from each other. We have group meetings. We have group meetings with our train with our graduate students. Uh, we we go to the different sites in the in the summertime. We visit the plots, and uh, we it's really been a very nice thing. So, with that, I just want to say thanks to the people who are funding this uh, this GAB initiative, the USDA through the NIFA program, and for me in Ohio, the Ohio Corn and Wheat program. So, with that, I am done. I appreciate, again, I appreciate the invitation. All right, maybe we'll get um, just both Clay and, uh, and Christine back up on the screen. So um, thank you so much, Clay. I think um, I, was, I was so surprised when you said there is no formal agreements, you know, there was kind of this... <laughs> You know, you know, big broad goal and just getting better varieties into the hands of growers sooner, and and the funders played a key role in that as well too. So I I know he talks about this as sort of nor grains. There is actually sun grains in the U.S. They're more yes. formal. Clay told me that they ha they do have agreements and charters, but they operate in the same way. So that is beautiful looking wheat on that last slide, I must say. So um, I just want that's to Ohio say, wheat. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> And the fact that you're getting your, you talked about your parents coming 25% or whatever coming from other programs. So you wouldn't have had that opportunity if you hadn't been working together. Um, so great. Yeah, I great think, um, I, I think last year, half my parents came from other programs. Oh my gosh. Amazing. Amazing. So, Which genetically, they're not that different from my own, but you know, I, they, they performed very well. So. Yeah, absolutely. So I just wanted to bring the conversation maybe together and I'll maybe kick it off with the first question, but um, we're going to transition to audience questions. So just a reminder for anyone that's here in person in Saskatoon with a question, please raise your hand and we're going to bring a microphone over to you so that all the people online can hear. And then for those online, um, please enter your question into the chat. We're going to get as many to, to as many of them as we can. I've got help from our one gifts team to be able to assist in that so i'm just curious i'm just going to kick off with one question but um just curious how thinking looking back maybe looking back and thinking about how you got started so maybe clay i'll, I'll kick it off with you first so looking back what what sort of brought you together may just sort of say you know, you talked about leveraging resources, tackling tough industry challenge. So was it one sort of scary concept that that you just sort of said, we, we just have to come together in this way? And I, I think about it from a Canadian perspective, too, sometimes that we are competing with the rest of the world. And so sometimes we think of ourselves as all, you know, smaller entities. But, you know, to me in Canada, we, we should be thinking about it from that broader. But I was just curious, how how did it all sort of come together and start? So, like I said, we we've always had these small cooperative trials where you know, like I could put eight lines in a cooperative trial. You know, this year I put in 70 lines in a cooperative trial. So <laughs> it's almost 10 times bigger now, but we always had that. 
the uh, thing that brought us more together was we just started getting some of the group funding together. And uh, it just became obvious with genomic selection that we could get cheaper genotyping and we could really leverage our resources if we share a germplasm. And, uh, you know, it helped if, if I had Illinois germplasm tested in Ohio, it helped me predict how well Illinois lines might at, perform in Ohio. So now the Illinois germplasm became more interesting to me because I could predict how well it would do because I actually saw a lot of it in Ohio. And plus a lot of it now was Ohio phenotyped. And so that fed into my genomic prediction models. So th that was a, a thing. Um, we didn't seem to run into too much uh, resistance from the people to join in, uh, in part because we could get more funding if we uh, just formed a consortium. You know, <laughs> if you dangle money in front of people, you usually get a lot of takers. <laughs> but it was, again, it wasn't a big leap from what we were already doing. We we're already doing the group genotyping. We we're already doing some cooperative testing. It was just taking the leap to do it at a large scale as we're doing it in the big six. And I think, and, and we weren't making people do things one way. And we recognized that everyone wanted to do things their own way. And we just had to you know, live with that. Yeah, no, that's amazing. It's, it's fine too. It's, it's good. There's no problems. Yeah. Christine, again, thinking back to 2008 and just the tremendous advancement have been made. So why did the air, dairy industry so strongly lean into this innovative technology? A yeah, great question. I think they recognized the immense potential of, uh, of genomics pretty early on. Um, there's in particular, I mean, genomic selection was was publicized first in 2001 in a, in a landmark paper by Moy Wisson uh, and Goddard. And then it took a little while for us to kind of feel comfortable with the idea of selecting probably either animals or plants that we hadn't phenotyped. I think generally people are really uncomfortable with that. But there was a, another paper, less known probably in the plant world, but written by a very, very important um, dairy geneticist or yeah, dairy geneticist, Larry Schaefer uh, of the University of Guelph in 2006. And he actually showed in his paper what the economic benefits would be if we implemented genomic selection on the large scale. And that just blew people's minds. You could, you could almost ask, why didn't we start earlier? Why didn't we start in 2006 when that paper came out? Um, but even now, I think we're, we're really, now we trust it. Now we see that the initial investment in genotyping, driven by this promise of long-term economic benefits, um, it, it really does pay off. Uh, the cool thing is we can use, we can now look at traits that, that you know, we can't phenotype everybody, but with genomic selection, we can, we can phenotype a few animals with these really expensive traits and then use that as a reference for, for selection in other areas. So uh, I think probably that paper had a lot to do with the, the, the implementation of it, but also there's just a whole slew of real, of realized benefits that we can see. And that is more important than anything else. Great, amazing. We do have one question in the room. So we'll, we'll maybe, we'll, we'll go there and just introduce yourself. Hi, uh, my name is Tayyip Sumro and I'm a bioinformatician. And so I have a question uh, for Dr. Christine Bays. I really enjoyed the, the presentation outlining all the genomics work that's accelerating uh, livestock breeding. Uh, and I also like the GWAS peak that you showed. It's really uncom uh, very, very not very common to see in plant world to see this huge peak. Uh, my question was about the, the genomic selection and marker assisted uh, selection. Um, how does it work in, in livestock? I, I mean, for, for plants, you can grow thousands of uh, plants and you can see uh, phenotype and, and do all of that. I'm, I'm sure it takes a long time for cows to, to grow and for you to look at the phenotypic uh, stuff. Uh, so I just wanted to know how that works. And also uh, if you can comment on the, the linkage in the genome, right? So I, I understand that in animals, the linkage is really uh, large. So, you know, breaking that down, figuring out exactly what part of the genome is contributing to a certain trait, how does that, how do you, how do you deal with, with, with that in, in livestock? Big questions. <laughs> awesome questions. Thank you so much. So um, let's deal with the second one first. The linkage and the linkage 
no, we use linkage disequilibrium. So linkage we can see within families. We we have in dairy in particular surprisingly large half sib families. So through the reproductive technologies like artificial insemination, there's maybe a million dairy cows in Canada, uh, but we've only got between a thousand and five thousand bulls that are used to inseminate that those million cows. So looking at that structure, we we do have a, a structure, a pedigree structure that we can use to follow linkage and and then on the population level, linkage disequilibrium in the classical quantitative sense of, of quantitative genetic sense of, of the term. Um, with regards to the first part of your question, um, I just made a brief note to talk about inbreeding, but I think that question has more to do with how genomic selection works in in livestock generally. And it that peak that I showed, those are rare in, in animals too. But uh, for example, there's only one uh, diacylglycerol acyl transferase one, DGAT we call it, that's a one single SNP that's actually responsible for about 40% of the variation in milk fat. That was colossal. We have never seen anything like that before or after that SNP was found, but um, they exist. It's like a, the needle in the haystack of the 3 billion base pairs in the, in the dairy genome. Uh, one of them might be a, a SNP like that. Um, but in a nutshell, we, we do have population structure. The genomes are large, uh, very complex, maybe not quite as complex as some of the people working in trees and that sort of thing. Um, but it's the same story. We use, we use mixed model equations, uh, old school, best linear unbiased prediction, um, and genomic selection works just the same. It's just a bit more complicated uh, to get the phenotypes because they're really expensive. Um, but we have a very, very, uh, in dairy in particular, of all the livestock species, I think dairy producers, believe it or not, they really do try hard. And there are systems in place nationally to collect all of those 102 different phenotypes. So believe it or not, but there are, there are registrations, there are organizations, Holstein Canada, for example, is responsible for keeping pedigree um, pedigree information on on probably 60 to 70 percent of Canadian dairy cattle farmers pay to be uh, in that program and then there's also the the dairy herd improvement program where farmers pay as well for a, a person to come to their herd and measure each cow so crazy traits things like rump angle and foot angle and leg score and rump length all these things are actually we have the data on individual animals across Canada, and we have been doing that for for decades. So we're really, really lucky here. We just have to work together to keep moving forward. And a cow Fitbit, I heard, is kind of in, a, <laughs> in that in the, in the collection of that. I wonder, you know, can we have a Tom? I'm looking at you. Can we have a a P Fitbit that we could collect <laughs> all that kinds of data? It would be a dream. Is there any questions online? Uh, yeah, we have a question online. So I thought actually this question could go to both speakers. Um, so can you comment on the percentage contribution from additive genetic variation and non-additive genetic variation to your phenotypic variation? Yeah, so I'll, I can answer that fairly quickly for wheat because we're uh, highly inbred. We like to assume that almost all of our uh, genetic variation is due to additive effects because we have almost no heterozygosity left by the time we, we put lines in the testing. So that's what we that's what we always assume, that mo almost all of our genetic variation is due to additive effects. And it seems to hold true when the studies are done. Yeah, I would I would agree with that. I mean, it, it depends a lot on the trait. Um, we're seeing through Dr. Marc-Andre Serrard's work that there is some... Um, there is some sort of non-additive effects and there are a few. Uh, we're looking at things like parent of origin effects. For example, a gene might work differently if you get, if you're inheriting it from your father compared to your mother. Um, that's super cool, but the, the true ratio is in my experience and what we've seen in our projects, the additive portion is, is usually 
larger and easier to work with than the, the non-additive effects. I have another question online. Again, I think this can go to both speakers, um, but it is directed for uh, the dairy. So as you breed for methane mitigation, what sort of trade-offs do you see and how do you address those challenges? So I think this question is also equally relevant for plant breeding as well. So maybe you can both take a look at it. Yeah, great question, uh, Tom. So methane emissions are directly related to the uh, the metabolism and the physiology of the cow. And interestingly enough, when you get right, I'm no nutritionist, I won't pretend to be, but uh, there is an association between methane production and fat production in the milk. For those of you who don't know, dairy farmers in Canada are paid for their milk through how much fat is in the milk. So that becomes very important. If we're starting to breed for cows that produce less methane, and then therefore, unfortunately, also reduce the amount of fat in their milk, we won't have any friends anymore. So, so <laughs> there are some trade-offs. There are biology is way more complex than we sometimes uh, admit. Uh, but I think we, the way that the that Lactonet has dealt with this is to, this is very complicated, but statistically remove or break the relationship between these traits so that we can breed for reduced methane independent of fat, protein, or milk production totally. That's a whole other way of doing things, but if we can keep these traits um, separate and make sure that we're not, we don't have these unintended consequences, um, that's that's probably the biggest challenge that we have uh, with these types of traits. They're, we're, we know this much, but there's probably a whole iceberg of, of additional biological repercussions. We just have to monitor very carefully um, and do the best we can. Well, for for us in wheat, uh, particularly for me in soft wheat, uh, I have about, fortunately, I don't have 102 traits to breed for. <laughs> <laughs> I got about four of them, and uh, there's virtually no genetic correlation between them. So if I select for high yield, it doesn't affect the other ones. Mm -hmm. But if you're looking at something like hard wheat, uh, where protein is important, then you get this negative correlation of yield and protein. You get high yield, you get lower protein. You get high protein, you get lower yield. So the selection there, they try to select for high yield while maintaining protein. And of course, it does make it more difficult. Uh, these are, there's physiological reasons for why these two traits are correlated. It's not like there's genes that need to be broken apart. No, the, the, the the, the, this correlation results from the physiological processes and you can't necessarily separate them. So you have to try to select for one while maintaining the other. And that does make it uh, harder to improve yield if you're trying to maintain protein or to improve protein if you're trying to maintain yield. So again, I'm just fortunate that I don't have to deal with those things in my crop. Great, thank you. We're almost to time, but I thought maybe one more question. Is there anybody in the room that has live studio audience? Tom. <laughs> A question for Clay. I, I was curious when you said uh, you, you use your GS model to predict how well these various lines will do in each state. And then if you like something, you ask for seed. And I was just curious if you meant ask for seed for crossing or, or something beyond that. Oh yeah, I'm I'm kind of greedy. I want I want seed to uh, generate a new line. So again, this is a fairly informal thing. Um, all germplasm belongs to the originator. So Nor Grains does not own any ger germplasm. So if there's a line from uh, Purdue and I want to test it in Ohio, I could test it. I could probably increase the seed of it, and I could propose it for release, but only with permission from Purdue. Purdue would be the owner of the germplasm, and we'd have to work out a commercial agreement to, uh, to, to come up with that type of release. But that would be a, that's a one-on-one -on -one arrangement for us. The Ohio State would work with Purdue to make that arrangement. And so we, we all acknowledge that um, and abide by the, those kind of rules. Now, the there's a group down south, they actually joint release everything. They actually share royalties. 
but they also have formal documents and charters uh, documenting all this and all their uh, intellectual property people are very involved with all the negotiations. I guess we've sort of decided we didn't really want all that headache. <laughs> so we will do it. We will do it when we have to, when they force us to. <laughs> but yeah, it's we acknowledge all the intellectual property belongs to the originator and we will negotiate it when those when their time comes. Now for crossing though, everyone is free to cross with everyone else's germplasm. There's no crossing restrictions at all. Okay, how many online questions? And I think if in the interest of time, I'm just wondering, and if people have a hard stop too, um, if we were, weren't able to kind of get to questions and I don't know, Brian, if you had a, a last burning one, are you sure? Go for it. Sorry, we have to get the microphone. Brian Rossnagle used to be with the Crop Development Center here, but I did a lot of work with my animal friends. And we talk about cows producing methane, but in reality, it's not cows that produce methane, it's the microbes in the rumen. The cow <laughs> is just a big vat. <laughs> and how do, you, how do you, you know, put that together with your work uh, that you've described to us, which is very elegant, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So I've heard that before, and you're, you're right. <laughs> but interestingly enough, um, the big vat that, that you referred to has a pretty big influence on the microbes in, in the gut. And, and I think we forget that. There's a pretty beautiful but awfully complex thing happening in, in our animals, in ourselves as well. If you think about our own digestive processes, um, that we, we don't even we don't even understand. But there have been some pretty cool research uh, done in Alberta, I believe, where where entire contents of rumens were swapped between animals. And it took about three weeks for those for the microbiota to return to what they were originally, despite the fact that these rumen contents had been switched. So for the most part, I think the host is is not just that vat. I think that host has a really important um, a really important influence on the microbiome, and we're just starting. To, unfortunately, our funders in the past weren't so interested in us doing that type of work. But now that we've now that we've moved through, you know, thirty million dollars of research funding, probably forty actually now. Um, we're at the point where we can say, okay, now we're, we've got all this phenotypic information. We're going to collect rumen samples as well and move forward and try and sort of leverage what other people have learned from nutritional studies, et cetera, to combine that with what we know about the old school genetics part. And with that, maybe we can start to get a better answer of that, of that, of what that relationship actually is. Of course, nutrition plays a huge role, but because of the the sort of criti criticalness of the the climate problem right now we need to use everything that we can get all the tools so um genetics genomics epigenetics nutrition uh metagenomics all the things that we have have to be have to be used together and that means kind of working with people maybe that we haven't worked with in the past but we'll get there Amazing. Well, this was a great discussion, and I'm sorry I'm going to bring it to a close. Um, but we do appreciate your engagement on this important topic. Um, at the Global Institute for Food Security, we're excited about accelerated breeding and the impact it can have within our innovation ecosystem, and ultimately delivering value for producers and the entire value chain, including consumers around the world. The case studies today from Christine and Clay demonstrate that, and it's great inspiration and motivation for the kind of impact that we want to have here in Canada, and because of the important role we play in global food security around the world. I also want to take a moment to congratulate others in Canada who have initiated similarly exciting work, including the Dry Breeding International Breeding Consortium, led by Dr. Valerio Hoyas Villegas, and the Winter Wheat Consortium in Eastern Canada, led by Sarom. And I noted, Clay, that that was a bleed from the U.S., and so you included um, the Ontario team in that collaboration, and now there's a great one going in Eastern Canada as well. To, um, so, so we're going to be watching okay. with that, that with great interest as well, too. Um, so I'm really looking forward to keeping this conversation going. Um, for those joining us in person, you're invited to join us for some treats at the back of the room. Those of you online and in person can also reach out to us um, at partnerwithus.com. 
at gifts.ca. However, I do want to please join me in thanking both Dr. Christine Bays and Dr. Clay Sineller for their informative presentations and the conversations today. Thank you so much. That concludes our seminar. Thanks so much, everyone.